Hey everyone, welcome. We're so glad that you can join us for tonight's event. My name is Jamie Rogers Southern. I'm Interim Executive Director of Bookmarks. If you are unfamiliar with Bookmarks, we are a literary arts nonprofit and independent bookstore located in downtown Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Our mission is to connect readers in our community with important books that challenge, educate, and entertain. So we're especially glad to have Erin Brock Brockovich with us tonight with her new book. Before we start and I bring our guests on stage, I just wanna mention a few things. If this is your first time doing an event on Crowdcast, you will notice a chat box at the bottom corner of the screen. Please use that to put any questions that you might have throughout the event for Erin, and we will get to those towards the end of the event. If you have any technical issues during the event, don't worry, the event is being recorded. So you can watch the replay following the event. Um, so no worries if you get cut off or if you have to leave early. Um, if you have not ordered Superman's Not Coming, I'm going to put the link in the chat box for you. You will definitely want to order it and read it after hearing Aaron talk if you haven't already done so. So now I'm going to invite our guests up on the screen. First, um, Justin Catanoso is a North Carolina-based journalist, Wake Forest University educator, and Pulitzer Center grantee with more than 30 years of experience covering climate change, healthcare, science, economic development, and business. He's the winner of the Science and Society Award and North Carolina Press Association Award for Public Service for his coverage of fraud in the tobacco industry in the early 90s. After 13 years as founding executive editor of the Business Journal in Greensboro, North Carolina, Justin is now professor of journalism at Wake Forest University in Winston-Salem. And Aaron Brockovich is the president of Brockovich Research and Consulting and the founder of the Aaron Brockovich Foundation, a nonprofit organization created to educate and empower communities in their fight for clean water. She's the co-author of Take It From Me, Life's a Struggle But You Can Win, and has her own show on podcast one. Superman's Not Coming is a book that looks at our present situation with water and shows us how we can each take action to make changes in our cities, towns, and villages before it is too late. So please welcome from your homes, Justin and Erin. Hi, Justin. Hello, Erin. How there are you? you? Are. I'm good. Hello. Hello, everybody. In North hey, Carolina. everybody. So can I just get that out of the way, like, really quickly? So everybody, this is an awesome book. It is extraordinarily well researched. It is thorough. It is clear. It is written for a general audience. Um, and it is inspiring. Um, if you drink water and you do, you should have a copy of this book. OK. Can we get started? Thank you. That's a lot coming from you. <laughs> You're welcome. All of your accolades and great work. Thank you. You're welcome. OK, listen, we have two weeks, two weeks for Election Day. <laughs> and uh, everybody take a deep breath. Um, in the last chapter of your book, Aaron, um, uh, you write, quote, the biggest barrier to clean water in our country is not chemical, physical, or financial. It's political. We have a political campaign that we're wrapping up, and we're going to have a big election in a couple weeks. What do you mean by that? Why, why is this all political? You know, I never like talking about politics. And... I've n never understood why politics are involved in water and politics are involved in water. And if you take a dive into the book, um, as much as I've never wanted to go there, I've had to really stop and say the lack of transparency and the cover ups isn't even just of the chemical, but it's how the system works. It's just a continual kicking the can down the road. Yeah. And for the sake of money on the upfront, we have the ability to change water systems, repair infrastructures, but we always want to shortcut the system, cheat the system and do it the cheaper way. And all of these things are set and can be changed by none other than policies, laws, regulations, policies. So this lands right on the desk of our leaders at 
you know, right in your own backyard, city council, and right at state level and federal level, how we're going to address a system that isn't working, that has had failures, that has total lack of transparency, that has major safety issues, and reform antiquated laws that have been on the books for 100 years, to reform policies that have been on the books for 100 years that do not apply or not applicable to our circumstances today. So it does lead you right into politics. And we have to change policies and science is based on policies and they do move based on policies or a law or what's not a law. And it makes me think uh, way back when I started my work in Hinckley, we were told for every reason we couldn't do it because of statutes and old law. And, you know, Mr. Masry came in and challenged that. And sure enough, we got through that. I've seen a challenge to a statute of limitations just recently in upstate New York. We have the ability to challenge these laws and policies and rules and regulations that may have applied and worked then. They are not applicable and do not apply today, especially as science catches up with policy and is showing us that many of these chemicals that have been in our water supply for decades. Yeah. So I want to stick with this for, for just a second, because you're speaking to some of these elected officials, some of these water authority officials. These are people that are affected by this as much as the general public. I mean, they're drinking from the same tap. What is your sense of, of what is holding them back from implementing some of the policies, upgrading some of the regulations that they know are needed? Um, because that's not their job. Their job is they have to follow the policies and the guidelines that are set. And oftentimes they don't challenge them. They'll go along with the status quo. So, you know, if you talk about Flint, Michigan, um, and we might get there and the lead problems across the board, goes back to a policy, the lead and copper rule that was written that says you only have to test for lead in your municipal system once every four years and you can average the samples. <laughs> okay. Even though we know how toxic lead is, like yes. no safe level. Yes. And so they just follow the guidelines. And that's the thing that we kind of share with you in the book, too, that can get a little daunting. Uh, it can be overwhelming. Your brain hurts. But even though we've set these guidelines, um, doesn't always deem that, in fact, it's safe. So, you know, the American Water Works Association, we're not their enemy. We're here to help. And they put out a notice to be prepared about this book because I'm sure they don't want to start answering a bunch of questions. But water is complex. I've always said it's never a soundbite. It's a story. Uh, it's how we're treating water at the municipal level. Um, we're not following the Safe Drinking Water Act. We could get into that about chloramines, but they don't want to follow what we should be following, a very Safe Drinking Water Act that states when you have problems and can't control your dirt in your system, you have to do the appropriate filtration system. Oftentimes they don't do that because they don't have the budget and they want to kick the can down the low, low you know, road. So they'll add ammonia to the system because it's cheap. They think it's just as effective, but we've now created another entire Absolutely. situation within the water where we have a problem. So yeah, want, no, their want, job is to follow the rules. I want, to, I want to step back for just a second because I am going to guess that a lot of people that are watching right now and, and that will see the recording of this know you from a movie that was um, came out 20 years ago. I watched it the other night. It's just as good as the first time I saw it. I um, love it. But, but there's a little bit of a double-edged sword of being like a celebrity, you know, and, and, and you are, you, you're famous, but you're not a celebrity. You have your own consulting firm. You have your own foundation. Tell us just briefly, like, what is the foundation from which, and, and by that I mean literal foundation, from which you have your credibility to pursue these different um, challenges in communities across the country? What base are you operating from? Principal, uh, what I see, what I know, is what I believe. 22, no, it's been 30 years on the ground. So let's start here. When I began my work in Hinckley out in late 1991, 92, what yep. was I, 30 years old? I'm 60 now with four grandkids. And it's like, I really thought that might have been a one-off or things would get better. And 
that's not what's happening. Again, we've just continued to kick and kick and kick this down the road till we actually really have a whole lot of problems. But a lot of it was how I grew up. I'm a dyslexic. I don't like being labeled and put into a box. I always was. And yeah. uh, I had a great mom that taught me the power of stick to And that just because somebody else saw me as, you know, a loser, um, that was their opinion and their choice to perceive me that way. But it didn't have to be my choice. Um, and that just because I was different, I wasn't inferior. So from a very early age, I've been judge, label, perceive, put in a box, stay in the status quo. And that's always irritated me. It just has. Yeah. I had a dad that was an engineer. He ran the pipelines for Citigroup. Hmm. And he always taught me the value of water, the value of land, the value of health. He used to sing me songs. Love the water trickling down the stream. Enjoy it today for someday. It might not be seen. I often wonder what he knew. But all of that, when I went to Hinkley, became very familiar to me. I saw a community that was uh, not getting information. They were being suppressed. They were being labeled hysterical mothers. Uh, I was told, you're not a doctor, you're not a lawyer, you're not a scientist, what do you know? And I said, well, let me tell you what I do know. That two-headed frog and that green water is bullshit. And I stayed rooted right there. And then for the rest of my career, I've just seen the same scenario play itself out over and over and over again in every single community. So I'm there, I'm a foot soldier, I'm on the ground. I know the people, I, I understand where they're coming from. I know reports, reports that have been redacted. We know that there is a chemical and it just becomes a whole clusterfuck situation. Sorry, I had to say that. No, I said I'm really I glad you did. We got it out of the way early. I'm glad you did. So, <laughs> so you have your own consulting firm now. Do you have employees? I mean, do you have a staff? I mean, do you have like an army that's out there sort of moving across the country, checking in on these complaints that are coming your way? Well, they do. So a lot of these groups are very activated. So I work with Robert Bocock a lot. So yeah. he and I are on um, on the same page. And if I'm gone, he'll get out there or I'll get out there. Like when Flint happened, I was in Australia. So yeah. I got the email and I was like, uh, no, this doesn't seem right. So I got it over to him and he got there uh, again the next day. And this was a year before Flint became what it was. I am involved in communities where there is litigation. And so that entire staff, uh, I'm a part of that staff where they're a part of my staff. We all work together. Yep. And then many times these communities begin to organize and they do. They kind of figure out their own head person. And then oftentimes they'll, they'll check back in with me or if we have to go out there, we will. So it's a, it's a moving staff um, and people and there's never an I ever. It's always a we. So there's always a group of us that will begin to tackle a situation. We get them stable and in a position where either the lawsuits are going to happen, they become extremely organized, they begin to do things for themselves, and then we will move to the next community. So I'm a foot soldier. I'm on the ground. And you're dealing with one of the most ubiquitous substances that we have, one of the most necessary, if not the most necessary substance that we need for our own health. Uh, we consume uh, uh, apparently upwards of 100 gallons of water a day, either in bathing or cooking or drinking. And we don't know anything about what's in it. We assume it's safe. And so Aaron, it, it help, help us sort of put this into some context. When you look across the spectrum, looking at your, you know, all your research, how many of us have been exposed to dangerous substances? How many in our own water, in our kitchens, in our bathrooms, wherever? How many of us are uh, have been at risk or are at risk for unsafe water as we sit here now? Um, potentially all of us. Uh, different chemicals, different ways to treat the water, low levels, significant levels. Uh, you know, we'll get into the whole PFOA thing, but there was just an article that we put up in a study done uh, on my public Facebook page that about 200 million Americans will be having drank or will drink um, high levels of this one chemical. That's what? almost all of us. Right? 
And it's like, what the, I, I said, see, I told you, you got to watch my mouth. So it's like, what? But yet we take no action and we're doing nothing. But yet, you know, oftentimes when I'll speak up about it, it's like, oh, no, she's crazy. That's not going to happen. You know, we wouldn't possibly do that. So, you know, the whole system has been eroded. And so if we're going to talk about water for a minute, because we have several situations in where we can be poisoned from water and don't think bacteria aren't deadly because they are. So we have chemicals, but let's take water 101. So most of our water comes from rivers, creeks, streams, and tributaries. Yep. We do have locations throughout the United States where we have aquifers. Now, LA, Southern Municipal Water District had a really good backup, battery backup aquifer. Uh, but that went to hell in a handbag because they can't use it anymore. It's so polluted. So wow. most of water is river creeks and tributaries. Water has organic matter in it, and that is simply dirt. Right. So when the water comes into the municipal system, they need to clean the dirt, right? So they're yep. going to add chlorine because we don't want a bunch of bacteriological E. coli outbreaks, correct? Exactly. What most people don't know is that when chlorination and organic matter meet, it creates a toxic compound called trihalomethanes. So TTHMs and THMs, you'll see us talk about that in the book. And the Safe Drinking Water Act specifically states, and if we would just follow the Safe Drinking Water Act, we'd be a whole lot better off, but we don't. We like to take the shortcut and we like to go the cheap route. But it states if you can't control your trihalomethanes, which is basically dirt in your system, you have to put on the appropriate filtration. But oftentimes we don't do that, hence we've got the big problem with chloramines, which is adding ammonia to the system. Well, let me tell you something. If we would just stop that act, here's what we would do. We would have less legionnaire outbreaks across the country, which we are, and that's a deadly bacteria. Make no mistake about it. Legionnaire is a waterborne disease. We would have less braining amoeba outbreaks, which we saw about two years ago. And a young 14-year-old boy died in Louisiana. And we just had a six-year-old boy die of it in Texas. And we would also have less lead contamination. So what happens when we add ammonia to the system? We have to understand you're adding and taking away a whole lot of chemicals within the water. Isn't our job to have less chemicals in our water? But we continue to mix and add more. And if we don't do it right, we have problems. So ammonia sequesters the effectiveness of chlorination. Guess what happens if you don't chlorinate effectively and you don't get it down the line? You get legionnaire outbreaks and you get breeding amoeba outbreaks. And so it, it also causes in the distribution system, the water becomes corrosive. You get biofouling. And if you've got lead pipes, guess what happens? It pits and corrodes the piping. And so all the iron, manganese, and lead precipitates out and is delivered to your tap. That's just one chemical that we could talk about and what we're not doing right. And if we change that, that's going to go to policy. Mm -hmm. So Aaron, you, you mentioned filtration. And is there a difference between like treating water and filtering water? Well, to, when they're 12, they treat water with chemicals. Yes, and but I mean like filtering water. I mean, we picture like it going through some kind of mesh or some kind of screen. Is that like a part of our cleaning our water before it gets to our tap? Most municipalities don't have, and you got to remember a lot of our municipalities were built a whole lot longer, right? Where we weren't seeing the influx of chemicals that we are today. And so they have to put on the appropriate filtration systems. Uh, and oftentimes they don't have it by way of example. And I keep saying, we're gonna get to the PFOA, the perfluorooctanoic acids, the PFCs, the Gen X, all of that. Um, so in Alabama, the water municipality ended up suing the polluter because they needed a hundred million dollars to put on the appropriate filtration systems wow. to keep that one chemical out. Wow. So that's not going to happen. They won and Alabama managed to get that done, but we've got 48,000 plus municipalities in this uh, country. So we're going to have to look at, you know, it is not cheap 
it is very expensive to have the appropriate filtration systems on your municipalities. And many municipalities don't have the budget or they've misappropriated their funds to put on the appropriate filtration. And we don't have, like, there isn't really a possibility for a sort of uniform water treatment standards from one state to another, one community to another, is there? Well, we should be, everybody should be following the Safe Drinking Water Act. And that's something that we don't do. Now, you can set levels for chemical at a national level and state can be different. Again, the PFOA is one of those chemicals where we don't even have an MCL yet. Don't even get me started on that story. And I know we're going to get there. But national guideline is 70. New Jersey, where it's a huge pollution issue, they've gone down to 12. We've heard that CDC might set a guideline at five. So yes, state by state wow. can vary. Wow. So um, as I go through your book, uh, North Carolina shows up a lot. You mentioned uh, the Duke Energy coal ash spill, which took place about 30 miles north of where I'm sitting right now. Uh, and we have a lot of coal ash that's threatening water supplies across North Carolina in the Southeast. You mentioned Camp Lejeune, uh, which is Jacksonville near our coast where they had dry cleaning uh, chemicals that were leaching into the water supply and killing babies for God's sake, uh, creating a whole cemetery of babies. But what I want to take you into in our, in our first anecdote, if we could, is Wilmington. Like Wilmington is a really popular tourist destination for a lot mm -hmm. of us here in the Piedmont of North Carolina. It's about a three and a half, four hour drive. And uh, it's a beautiful town. It's near the beaches. We all go to Wilmington. They have been wrestling with their water quality as most of us don't know or have any idea of for years. Tell us about Wilmington. So Wilmington is a beautiful place. And many years ago, and it wasn't that many years ago. God, I don't know if I want to say five. Uh, thanks to COVID, I'm in a rabbit hole. I'm really like not sure what day, what possible year it is or what year I did that. Normally, I'm really good at that. But so forgive me. But we got called because they had a big water pollution down there with a chemical called Gen X. And Gen X uh, was a successor to PFOA. It was, <laughs> this isn't funny. And I think when I get frustrated, you'll hear that laugh. It was deemed to be safer than the PFOA, perfluorooctanoic acid. It took me a year to learn how to pronounce that correctly. And I'm like, I don't give a fuck, it's a poison. Okay, let's keep going. So, um, and it is, and you would know it as Teflon. Okay. So we came out to that area because this now safer chemical um, was getting out of the bag, it was getting in the river, it was causing water issues. And most importantly, and why I got called in, the community was experiencing health effects and they were very concerned. And so, we're still dealing with Wilmington, North Carolina. This is interesting to me, and maybe this is where I talk about the PFOA. Okay. Because this is exactly how the system works. I'm gonna do my best to explain this. Let's start with PFOA and PFOS, which are part of the PFC, which is a fluorinated chemical family group. And it's, it's about 3000 different chemicals all made up into one. The PFOA is Teflon. The PFOS is firefighting foam, Scotch guard. It would just be in everything we use. 30 years ago, 3M, DuPont, you know, they had documents, they had science, they notified the EPA. This is kind of a bad chemical. So keep your eye on it in water. It's more than bad. It's, it's almost impossible to remove it from the environment. So, so, how is it, so, so how is it getting into the water? These, these are plants that are operating near bodies of water and they're dumping? One of our biggest sources for the firefighting foam contamination is our Department of Defense. Okay. And uh, PFOA is um, chemical manufacturers. They use it in numerous processes. And, you know, the $64,000 question is really, what do we do with all our waste? Oftentimes it gets dumped into rivers, creeks, and tributaries and flows down the river and gets sucked up into the municipalities. Okay. So what happened with this one chemical? The EPA gets notice and they're like, okay, so we'll set a guideline. A guideline based on what science? They didn't have any, but they set a guideline at 400 parts per trillion. 
So then they go to commission a study. And those are very expensive. So if the EPA is not being funded, you know, they can only pick a few chemicals a year to study out of the tens of thousands that get into the marketplace. So they set out to do a study. They set a guideline at 400 parts per trillion. And the municipalities could run this chemical through their system up to 400 parts per trillion. Life goes on, right? For 25, 28, 30 years. Until about four or five years ago, science caught up with policy. The study was complete. In Houston, we have a problem. This chemical causes cancer and numerous diseases. What? Well, that shocks me. You put a poison in the water and you're just going to be surprised that it caused problems. So now the EPA moves to set the guideline from 400 parts per trillion to 70 parts per trillion. So for feasibility reasons, the municipalities across the country are like, well, wait, what? We don't have the money to put on the appropriate filtration to bring it down to that level. You said we could run it up to 400 parts per trillion in our system. Can I stop you for a second? Isn't somebody putting this shit into the water? Like, shouldn't we start at the source and say, stop dumping Gen X into the water 100 miles from Wilmington? Yeah, here's what you should do. The system is ass backwards. You wanna talk about politics and policies? The EPA should require these chemical companies to admit, submit a study first before you ever put it into the marketplace and it gets into our water supply. Really? That's where I would start. Even the <laughs> FDA will require studies first before you can put a product into the marketplace, not at the right. EPA. Right. You can just bring all your products in and we'll push them through. We'll set these little guidelines. So this is what happened with the PFOA. Now what's interesting to me with Gen X, think about how I just said the PFOA started, how long it took to do the science, science catches up with policy. You know, you're still not getting a lot of answers on Gen X and this story isn't over yet. Because they're, first of all, ask about appropriate filtration systems for Gen X to keep it out. Well, there's not enough information yet to conclude what particular filtration will keep it out. And there certainly isn't a not enough information to conclude about health issues. This is just another scenario of PFOA playing itself out again. And we're going to go along with the exact same thing and wait for the studies only to conclude down the road. Shit. We were wrong. Because science lags behind policies. So this was actually something that our governor, who is a Democrat, uh, Roy Cooper, he's running for re-election right now, um, became aware of. He asked for a special uh, committee to oversee what was happening with our water quality, particularly in Wilmington. He asked for uh, more staff for the Department of Environmental Quality. And he runs up against a Republican-dominated legislature that says no to both. We need this in North Carolina. We need it in one of our uh, biggest tourist destinations. And our legislature says no. Uh, obviously, I'm surprised, but I mean, I just, I, I, like, help, help me here, Aaron. What, like, what, like what, what do we do? We've got a governor trying to do something and we've got a legislature, legislature saying no. I mean, what do we do? Well, um, first of all, let's have a conversation about Republican Party if we could. Um, you know, I was born and raised in a staunch Republican family, and yet they taught me the value of water. And this is where I don't like to talk about politics. This shouldn't be reserved for a Republican issue to stop it or a Democratic issue to let it go through or vice versa. We, we got to stop that shit and get together on water, which is the most important issue for all of us. Let's be honest. We don't have any water. We're fucked. I'll say what George Carlin said. Oh, we may not have any water. The planet will get through that. She'll be fine. We're fucked. And those issues are real and happening. So one thing that I see is when communities get activated, and this is why it's so important to vote, understand, you know, here in California, we have all the propositions, yep. know what they mean. Uh, and it can be hard to catch legislation. I've seen it happen here in California where they'll slide something in on some other bill and you never know it even got passed. So it's pretty tricky, but when you learn of what you just talked about, 
I think it's super important that the community and the people of North Carolina, whether you make phone calls, get to your own congressman or woman or uh, senators, that this is something you're not going to have and sign petitions and really get collective. I have learned everywhere I go. It may start with one, but when it becomes 10 or 100 or 500 or 1,000 or 5,000 or 10,000 or more, that mass movement will get the attention um, of your legislator. So it's important that the people have pushback. And this is why, in part, I did Superman's not coming. And oftentimes we think, because we're not a politician or a doctor or a lawyer or a scientist, you don't have to be any of that to know what's going on and where you have confirmed contaminations throughout your state, whether it be North Carolina or, you know, the whole Gen X situation or Duke Energy and the coal ash and the Chrome 6 problems, to care about water and to say, this is bullshit and we need or we back our governor on providing these oversight committees and begin to take a deeper look at this issue. Um, it's very frustrating. I'm one of you in that regard. Uh, and it's you just kind of bang your head, but uh, you have to make it your business. So one of the things that you do really well, uh, among the many things you do well in this book is, is almost provide a roadmap for what citizens uh, need to be looking for need to be um, with their eyes, what they can smell, um, uh, mm -hmm. how they can react. Uh, you, you give a list of the questions that they should be asking, where they should be going to ask these questions. It's sort of uh, an empowerment book that you, that, you, that you are trying to do. What's interesting about it is, it, and again, it's sort of in, embedded in the title of your book, Superman's Not Coming. You know, we have agencies, we have institutions, <laughs> we have elected officials, we have government. And we, we put these people into these positions and we trust them to, to protect our health. And they're not. And so basically what you're saying, and, and, and I'm not going to ask you why. We know why. We've, we've, we've covered it already. But it really does come down to us. We need to be advocates for our own health. Absolutely. We have to be and we have to believe that we can. So this is where I want to share a story with you because it fascinates me and I'll go through it as fast as I can. I was born and raised in Kansas, definitely fascinated with the movie Wizard of Oz because I always thought I was going to be Dorothy on my journey of life. But what really fascinates me isn't the film, but it's the book written by L. Frank Baum, The Wizard of Oz, and why he wrote the book and to tell it through almost, you know, a fairy tale. But he wrote the book at the pre-height of the Industrial Revolution as a way to teach his children the power of individualism and thinking for oneself in a industrialized world that would increasingly begin to speak for you or hide information from you. <laughs> so here we all know Dorothy. She's a representation of the girl next door. And this, this story has a real political allegory. And for years, I felt that's exactly where we are. Talk about history repeating itself. Yeah. And it's very well studied um, by many a scholar. You can look it up yourself. It's a great read on Google. But Dorothy's the everyday girl next door. And the cast of characters each has their own meaning. So the Cowardly Lion was about L. Frank Baum's best friend, William Brian Jenning, who was always running for populist for president, yeah. but never won because he had fiery rhetoric, but no courage. That sounds like a lot of politicians we may know. Yeah. And then the Tin Man was a representation at the time at, in the pre-industrial height of the you know, industry, lost his heart to industry, a mistreated worker. Boy, we've seen a whole lot of that. And then the scarecrow was all about the farmer who represented the American farmer, who everyone thought had no brain, because at that time the banks were buying up all their land. So it makes me take a look at this representation. Is that the, the idea of America, the girl next door, the politician, the industrial worker and the farmer? And so if you read the political allegory, the twister is actually a representation of disruption in Washington, D.C. Hmm. And the house gets picked up by the tornado and lands on the munchkins, who are the citizens, who are not happy. Hmm. And they tell Dorothy, you got to follow the yellow brick road, which was the standard. It was the path of gold. Follow the money. Huh. So I look at this and I'm always fascinated with it. And so here they go off on their journey and they get put to sleep by the Wicked Witch. 
who was about industry. And guess what? I don't want you to know what I'm doing over here. And I've often stopped and thought, did we get put to sleep? Did we buy an illusion? Did we get fooled? Were we comfortable? Were we complacent? Were we busy doing our lives? And so you kind of know the moral to the story, but it's really important here because as they wake up, and I think we're waking up, I think a lot of this turmoil that we're seeing is a wake up call. And, and we're moving around and we're like, what is really going on over there? Because maybe we took it for granted. Our leaders would have our backs. Yes. But here, when they pull back the curtain, they realize that, you know what? <laughs> there is no wizard. What have you been doing back there? Just pushing and pulling a bunch of levers. Really? But what they learned was exactly what we need to learn. They had forgotten or been told, you don't have a brain, you don't have the heart, you certainly don't have the courage to stand up. But the moral of that story is they did, and they found their way back. And I believe for a whole host of reasons, and I just explained them, why we may have been absent. But I also believe we're here, we're waking up, and we need to realize we've underestimated the power of us for a very long time. You've got a brain, you don't need a PhD to care about water or to look something up or to educate yourself on an issue. Find that courage again. And oftentimes we're afraid to speak out because you're, you're ridiculed or shamed or, you know, nobody wants to be the first person to raise their hand in a class and get the answer wrong, right? And follow your heart. We've forgotten these things. And I think they're coming back in our face really strong. And I, I want to share that story because I want people to know, and I think there's a whole host of reasons we don't always speak up. Yes, you can. And I think we're in a moment in time where we must. Aaron, you learned that in Hinkley. You learned that with the first people that you went to and they said, <laughs> yeah, but, but PB&G, they told us that that chromium stuff was good for us. And the little girls are swimming in the backyard and they believe them. And so it wasn't until Dorothy entered their life but it didn't no. make sense to me it didn't make sense to me and i think that frustrates all of us because we see a lot of things that just don't make sense to us because we want to believe it is a sock in our gut to possibly imagine over decades a system that's eroded that our leaders are who we thought wouldn't have our back it takes a moment to kind of burn wait a minute, what's going on? And, and that is part of, you know, we even say in the book, the nine steps is separating fact from fiction and or deception. So you can make better informed decisions, what's going to be right for you and the health and welfare of your family and community. Aaron, so while we're, we're, again, we can. while we're fighting for this change, should we be drinking bottled water? Bottled water comes with its own issue. Bottled water is basically reverse osmosis water. Uh, listen, I so travel that, Define that, define, reverse osmosis, define that. So reverse osmosis is a system where the water goes through numerous chambers. So there isn't one filter that cleans out every chemical because each chemical needs a different filtration system to be cleaned. So uh, carbon, resins, coconut shell. So if you have a bunch of PFOA in your water and you only have a coconut shell filtration system, you're probably not going to get out your PFOA. So this is why you have to know what's in your water first in order to know how to treat it or filter it. A reverse osmosis system would be the most effective because it's layers of different resins and carbons and charcoal filters and um, coconut shells. And so it's got all these chambers it moves through. So as it moves through, if you have that chemical, that resin could capture it. And I'm seeing some movement, by the way, uh, in Texas, where they're looking at asking homeowners to put on reverse osmosis systems on the, at the outside to capture the water coming in. And there will be significant tax and rebrake breaks because I know the municipalities aren't gonna do it yet. 
And this is part of our infrastructure that we're going to have to look at that is failing and possibly put every municipality on a reverse osmosis system. So that's a filter that you can find. There's some countertop ones or sink mount. You're, they're in home. Um, but, you know, some of the water filters that you see that you can trust, again, not one filter will clean out every chemical that could potentially be in your water, including ammonia, chlorine, uh, trihalomethanes, even at low levels of chemicals. And so this is going back to kind of what we were talking about, that common sense set of skills. Yeah. And you have to take a look at the science. It, it doesn't make sense to me why I, why I'm going to argue about a poison is a poison is a poison in its water all day long. So we all know arsenic. So your headline reads, it's highly contaminated with arsenic. Mm -hmm. It's not like we're going to call the National Institute of Health and go, well, you recommend, you know, four parts per billion and I have three. Think I should drink it? No. And we have to understand <laughs> that a lot of these guidelines and MCLs that are set up just because that's set as a guideline or an MCL doesn't deem it's safe. And again, we all started about politics, right? And policies. Here we go again. Let's talk about Chrome 6 for one real quick second. We've been fighting this situation for over 20 years in the state of California. We don't look or have a guideline or an MCL for hexavalent chromium in drinking water. We have a national guideline for chromium, total chromium, chromium of 100 parts per billion. State of California for years, even when I began in, Hif in Hinkley, was 50 parts per billion. But mind you, we're not looking for hexavalent chromium in the water. So after the film came out and everything, California decided we would start setting a standard for hexavalent chromium in the drinking water. It's taken 20 years and we're still fighting about this. Wow. We made progress, but it's important. I want you to understand what I'm going to say here. Um, the public health goal. We're supposed to be following the public health goals. And maximum contaminant limits and guidelines, et cetera, should be set as close to that public health goal as possible. But oftentimes we don't. Why? Money, feasibility studies. So we had all the top experts, state, everybody was working on this. Five of them conclude in California, the public health goal for hexavalent chromium in drinking water is 0 0.02 parts per billion. Well, well, that's a big issue for the municipalities. Talk about a feasibility study. So what happened was they set the MCL at 10 parts per billion. That's pretty far away from the public health goal. But now we've been thrown back down into court, so we have no standard right now until we fix the feasibility study. So it's a cost factor versus a safety factor. And we don't follow that public health goal, which is what we should be doing. I know that was a long response. You know, yeah, and we lost track of bottles in there somewhere because ultimately, oh, yeah. Ultimately, like bottles aren't the answer. No, they're not. They're a convenience. They're a convenience. Uh, if I'm drinking bottled water, I like to look for glass. We all know the issues we've had with plastic, the pollution, uh, the plastic island. And yeah, you're right. I jumped. But there was a reason why. I'll, it'll come back to me here in a minute. But this is why nobody invites me to a party. You can't <laughs> ask me a question about water because when I'm done, they're like, Ooh, don't bite her. So yeah, bottled water, most of it's reverse worry. osmosis. And go back to using your instincts. You know, I've been in many, many, many countries. In India, I open bottled water. You know, you don't hear that snap or was this not sealed right? And you yeah. can smell dirt. Yeah, no, not going to do it. Um, and we question that. And I don't want us to do that. And I have all these people sending me these water photos. You you generally know what's going on in your own backyard, but there's a whole host of reasons why we don't push. But bottled water is a convenience. You know, listen, I travel. Uh, if there's a major earthquake, uh, we've seen situations where you clearly need a bottle of water in Flint. Absolutely. You clearly need it in West Virginia with that big MC, 
HM contaminant that came down and they had no water. You're going to need bottled water if we don't address climate change. Frankly, if we don't have any water, if we continue to have all this flooding that can shut down your municipality for weeks. So it's a necessary convenience. Um, it's oftentimes reverse osmosis in the right locations. I do rely on it. I will drink it. I always search for glass or that that recyclable product because the, the plastics has been such an issue. Yeah. So you brought up a topic that I want to move into, um, and, and that is climate change. And, and, and it's, this is an issue that I've covered for years and have seen, um, you know, a dire scientific reality politicized at the highest levels. Um, help us understand the connection between climate change and clean water. You do a really good job of this in your book toward the end. You know, somebody asked me once, what does climate change have to do with water? And I'm like, oh, um, everything. <laughs> so, you know, I think what happens is, you know, we think of climate and air, it's not tangible, we can't always see it, but it's water, it's ice, it's warmer temperatures, icebergs melting, that turns into water, that rises water levels in the ocean. It causes warmer atmospheric conditions. What are we seeing? We're seeing more hurricanes, bigger storms, more flooding, definitely down Florida, Alabama, Mississippi, those areas, even parts of North Carolina, you're getting too much water. And then we have all those massive floods and then we have all the pig farms and pollution or industry and the refineries being eroded by water. The pollution comes out, the municipalities, they can't deliver water. That's a huge water problem. Then, then you've got the other side where I'm living here in California and we are in a drought. We've also got a big problem with the backup water supply that's too polluted that we can't now use. So climate change is going to be too much water, not enough water, drought, or no water. It is a water event. And we talk about Johannesburg, South Africa. They were literally going to run out of water. Do not think that we haven't been to places where these municipalities have a 50-year plan they're not going to make it. They're not going to make it. So you, have, so a whole, you have a whole chapter called Day Zero about, about Cape Town. Day and, Zero. And how, like, just because we're not hearing about Cape Town anymore, does it mean that Cape Town is out of the woods when it comes to water? Where, where, where are they now? This is a major cosmopolitan city, one of the richest cities on the continent of Africa. Because they were doing something, and they will always be aware that this could happen to them again that they diverted the disaster. Do you know why? Because they worked together, they planned together, they rationed together, the people worked with the government together, and they prepared for day zero. And because they were prepared, they were able to divert day zero. That is the one thing we won't do here. We won't even acknowledge necessarily climate change. We're clearly not working together or changing any policies to help us divert what could be an inevitable disaster. Why? And it is about preparedness. And it is about that moment where we have to coordinate together. And there is a storm approaching. And I, want to, I, want to, I want to drill down a little bit more on, on Cape Town because what they did, they were down to like 13 gallons per person per day, yes. Yes. Which, which was nothing. Yes. So, so how did they get a population as large as Cape Town to go along with that? Or didn't they give them a choice? Was it just sort of regulated? This is what we've got if we're going to get through this. They didn't. And the people, um, you know, they, they, I think they understood water. I think they understood what it meant not to have water. I think that maybe we've taken it for granted in many places in the world have, and they haven't always had that luxury. There's many places that don't. So they knew they were able to ration their water. They had already been living in some situations with less of it. And it was total cooperation. And they would rather have that small amount and ration it willingly if in fact it was going to keep the water coming. And that's what they did. And they were rationed down to very little. And, and we, we were very comfortable in this country with, you know, 
our sources of water and always assuming that it'll be available for us. But that isn't always true, especially if we don't look at beneath that rock and what might really be happening. So this community for me was a perfect example of the collective and the understanding that I'd rather have less now so I can have it in the future and working together and governments moving as good leaders. Do you see, do you see any model? Up. Do you see any model communities as you move across the United States that are actually um, doing more things well with water quality and uh, yes. uh, water conservation than others? Like who would be some models? I mean, we spend a lot of time talking about the disasters. Um, where are you seeing the heroes? Where, where are you seeing the communities that we can point to and say, we've got to do more like them? Uh, Poughkeepsie in upstate New York is a perfect example. Their water operator, Randy, so they were switching over to the ammonia, which we call chloramines. And he did the power of observation. A, he understood his water customer. He understood his water. So when he turned on the uh, ammonia feed within days, his observation was, huh, everyone's calling me. What's wrong with water? What's that smell? It's kind of like burning my skin. My eyes burn. What's going on? So he noticed for quite some time this was happening. And then he's like, what have I done differently? What's happened to the water? You know, asking questions, getting curious. These are the things that we actually talk to you about in the book. So he goes, oh, I turned on the ammonia feed. He turned it off. That's what happened. Calls stopped. Long story short, his upper management came in and said, you need to turn that, you know, ammonia feed back on. And the whole process began again. But what they learned beyond even the people being harmed is that it was deteriorating their distribution system. And they've had to completely replace their system. They won't be using ammonia again. That is a water operator that made his job his job and listen to the people. I, I don't know why we don't listen to people. You know, even in Hinkley, nobody listened to him. For me, it's like, it doesn't make sense that 600 people are making up the same story. It just doesn't make sense as a water raper. Why are you all calling me? What happened? Everything was fine. To make it your business to find out what's going on. The ladies of Hannibal, we talk about them and they, they stick out for me. Uh, they had lead levels as high as Flint. And Flint switched river waters, can't do that. And in Hannibal, they had the lead contamination because of all the adding of ammonia. So a group of moms made it their business. What is this? We went out there and taught them about it. They studied it. They asked questions. They got curious. They said, I'm not going to have this. I don't want my children poisoned by lead. And as they got stronger and stronger, they began to inform and educate the community. They'd have community meetings. They'd have events. And over time, they were pretty strong about their position on no ammonia. So one of the moms ran for city council and she won. And she did a referendum and they changed the law and put it out to vote to the community. Ammonia, yes or no? Everyone said no, because now they knew what was going on. And then the state got into a litigation with them, but they persevered. They had that stick to -itiveness. And I'm happy to report to you as of March this 2020, Hannibal, Missouri, because of those women, because of that community, because of raising a concern and understanding it, have lead free water. So is ammonia something that is optional for water treatment? Yes, you don't have to be adding ammonia. Again, we'll go back to the Safe Drinking Water Act and the trihalomethanes that are created by adding chlorine and organic matter. If you can't control the dirt, you've got to do the appropriate filtration system. And so they've chosen ammonia because it's a shortcut and it's cheaper, it's more cost effective than following the Safe Drinking Water Act. And that's what we need to do. You know, we have these regulations here, or uh, Safe Drinking Water Act for a reason. Uh, now there could always be something within it like the lead and copper rule and those things that you can change and reform, um, but we've got to get busy recognizing we're still relying on an antiquated system, laws, policies, and infrastructure from a really long time ago. We're just a way bigger population, way more industry. You know, these chemicals in water, um, latency periods happens. With, you can get exposed to some of these chemicals and not see an effect for 15, 20 years. You know, they can get hidden. I don't want to get into the science, and we could. I talk about that in the story where science can be bought and paid for. 
And Absolutely. science has a way to hide numbers. And that's where we can really get into some trouble. Do you see communities willing to spend the money necessary um, to have the filtration systems and have the up-to-date uh, water infrastructure so that their communities are safe? And by that, I mean voting for their own tax increases through bond issues. Do you see communities willing to pay for that rather than just be up in arms and complain and say, fix this? They are when they understand what's happened. Um, they do get frustrated and we do have to look at that. There are municipalities who misappropriate their money and instead of doing the filtration system, you know, they'll go build a ball field. That does make any one of us mad. But I tell you 99.99% .99 of the time of the consumers I deal with, I'd rather pay a little higher water to know that I've got the appropriate filtration system on and not invest in some ball field and then I'm paying for more water that's polluted. So you do see, again, this is the wake up where I think enough patterns have happened for all of us over and over and over and over again that we're like, uh-uh, something's not going on. And this is where we, the people, you know, I think, <laughs> We've been underestimated. Don't underestimate yourself. This is really a moment. This isn't a, a joke. I'm not just a chicken little is, you know, gonna fall out of the sky. I've been across this country. It's communities across this country. It's a plethora of them writing and emailing in the photos. That we can put all of this together in the book to show you. This is where we're going to need to go. And that is, again, make it your job, make it your business and understand this doesn't have to come down from the top. Yes, they've got their guidelines. They don't follow them. Right now, the current administration is making some bad rollbacks, and we don't even need more regulations, but we need greater enforcement of some of the great regulations that are already in place. Absolutely. But we don't want to do that. Aaron, we just have a, a minute or two left. And uh, we, we have covered a lot of ground. This has been uh, technical. It has been personal. Uh, it's been impassioned. It's been all those things. It's been great. Do you have a headache? Um, I have a headache now. <laughs> I'm serious. You've been at this a long time. And, and, and sometimes I think it's like, you know, you see one step forward and you might see three, four, five you steps do. back. You As do. I cover climate change, I, 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 I'm not giving up hope. But, man, it's really hard to not give it up is. hope. So as, as we wrap up, I, I, I want to ask you, how do you maintain hope and um and what is your message for those of us out here that are willing to fight the battle that you are urging us to fight uh we need to do it I, you know to the day i die will always believe the seal by the people for the people we the people i don't know if we the people have forgotten about us the people and so much of this is about um finding that strength that courage uh, you know what when i feel down i'll think of dorothy again I'll hear my mom and stick to itiveness. Um, I see communities underestimated. I see them rise. And that for me is very inspirational. And something I, I think we become disconnected from our environment. And we have to understand the environment is us and we are the environment. Absolutely. Um, you know, it's just like the Rachel Carson, who in 1960 wrote this, 1963 to be exact. And it's the, at the beginning of my book. I'm a, I'm a great admirer. She was talking about this in the 60s. Hello, yeah. people, it's still 2020, and we're having this conversation. We talk about in the 60s when the Cayuga River in Ohio was on fire. <laughs> Has much gotten better? What have we been doing? But she says something, and I have it right here, and it's I go back to it all the time. Man's attitude toward nature is today critically important simply because we have now acquired a fateful power to alter and destroy nature. But man is a part of nature and his war against nature is inevitably a war against himself. We're challenged as mankind has never been. And this is true. And she wrote this back in the 60s. And it's triple that challenge today in 2020. We've ne uh, mankind has been challenged as he's never been challenged before to prove our maturity and our mastery, not of nature, but of ourselves. I have learned in the environment over the course of 30 years, the more I peel back the layers of the environment, the more I've peeled back the layers of myself. We are connected. This is a planet we all call home. I can't think of a greater fight than our fact that we need air 
and water to survive. And I find my inspiration in the environment. You know, we're what, 73% water, the brain's 93%, the heart and organs 83%. Think about the resiliency of water. Yeah, I just said we're water, right? And you watch water carve hills and valleys. Well, we're water. We should be able to carve our way through some of these policies and system that didn't deliberately fail, but failed and over time was corrupt and eroded. And I think about water has the power to erode and transform coastal landforms. So when I see it, if I'm water, I can be that. And I think we've disconnected. And because we are, we're lost. We need to connect again. The one thing that every single one of us on this planet knows. We are water. We need water. We can't afford to not have water. It's game over for all of us. And speaking of games, think of it like the Super Bowl, okay? So you know before you get into that game, there's going to be a lot of tension. You're going to get knocked around, right? So you go out there, you catch the ball, you run a little, and they get shoved back 30 yards. You don't like throw your ball down on the field and walk off. We be going, what are you doing? Pick the ball back up. Understand we can get knocked around and pushed down. But here's what I want us to understand. Okay, so what you got knocked down? So what you fail? So what? You may not have a master's degree or a PhD. That doesn't mean you're not human and that you can't have the courage and the determination and the persistence and the heart to get up and pick up that ball and fight for your life like the rest of us are for the value of water in our environment. You might be surprised you're gonna rush 100 yards and make a goal. Aaron Brockovich, <laughs> it is a delight to have you with us here oh, in you. the Piedmont of North Carolina. Uh, you have written a great book that we need at this time. Uh, it is timely to be talking about it two weeks before the election. Thank you for sharing your time, your expertise, and your passion with us. And uh, for bookmarks, that is our program. Thank you. Thank you so much. Be well, North Carolina. You've got a great, beautiful state and a lot of, a lot of land and a lot of water to protect, love, and I think you can do it. Get in there and fight for it, man. We do have to fight for it. All right. It was Back fun. to you, Jamie. It's fun. It was fun. Thank you. Hope to see you.